Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode five of The Good, The Bad and The Rugby. It's very nice to be back with you once again. We've got a bumper episode for you this week. Hask and Tins are reunited, destroying the internet rumours uh, that spread quicker than Neil Buchanan being Banksy. Are we still loving each other? Always. When do we have a fallout? No, that's, that's the, the internet rumour. I love Tins. I'll never have a fallout. Tins has got a bit of a poison tongue because he's a bit of a bitch sometimes, but he never does it to me. <laughs> right. <laughs> Keep it clean. Keep it clean. I, um, I haven't been on this show to really pass comments on what is going on with your lid at the moment. It's basically it's just disappeared, isn't it? Well, it, it's sort of gone into cloak mode, a bit like out of Star Trek, you know, like a, a Vulcan thingy. It's sort of gone just blonder. It's not less, it's just gone white. I don't know why. People keep going to say I've been to a bleach factory, but I haven't. Do you think you're getting close to the point where it's, it's tin style? No. I've got five or six more haircuts left into this setup. <laughs> I was wondering what you were going to say when you said a bleach factory. I didn't know what you and Chloe had been up to, but... Uh... <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wait, uh, too early. We've got an early record this week <laughs> because we've got Ma Nonu joining us a little bit later from Wellington. So, I mean, it's, it's coffee rather than the usual ale. Although, it turns you went ale, I think, at 9.05, didn't you? I'm pretending I'm basing myself in an airport right now, so it doesn't matter, international rules. Can I ask you two, have your, um, both of your erections subsided yet after Jason Leonard's show? Because you were both <laughs> very excited. Like, I saw Alex, like, like a fanboy in Tins, was, like, trying not to laugh, go, oh, there's my special friend. It was very <laughs> lovely to see you. Did, did, you get see. did you get jealous? Is that, is um, that anything? Do you know what? There was a bit where I was looking at the numbers and I thought your show might do better than the ones that I and then it didn't and I was like, oh, that's fine, isn't it? So don't worry about it. <laughs> I'm getting a lot of abuse at the moment for apparently getting too involved. I have to sit behind a screen and just let you guys get on with it because that's what the people want. Give the people what they want, Alex. Give the people, Give what, the people they want. what they want. This week we've got Mar Nonu joining and I'm delighted that you're both on because, uh, Tins, obviously you played against Nonu in his debut and Hask, you played with him. He's got more clubs than you, which is saying something, um, but at the Rico Black, Black Ram. So, Let's come to that in a moment or two, but there have been some quite interesting stories around the game this week. Should we just start with a quick debrief on Dylan last week? Tins, obviously, you know, I know you, I know you listened to that. What did you make of it? It's a lot of pickup on social media, particularly around the injuries. I really enjoyed the show. Uh, I, I love Dylan. Obviously, he was, uh, well, he was his, he self proclaimed in my vice captain when I was captain, which made me love him even more. I didn't agree with some of the stuff he said around the injury stuff in terms of. Only the bit around right, he's part of a cog of a big of a big machine, and he never felt he could stick his head above the parapet. I was like, well, you're England captain. If you can't stick your head above the, ca- the parapet as England captain, yeah, he's quite happy to call out a committee member for saying that please thank the committee. I don't really buy that. I think, as Hask said, and Hask is a great example because Hask did more than probably any other player off the pitch in terms of doing his own conditioning, extra conditioning, speed work with Margot. Um, you know, physio with Kevin, you know, he sort of set that bar, whereas I still think you are responsible for your own body. Now, I would agree that uh, there were times in, in games where I knew I shouldn't play that week and I played, but most of those ended up in injury. But then from that, I learned. And depending on your relationship with your coach, I was able to then say, next time I felt that way, I said, look, I can't play. And the coach would back me because, as Haskell rightly said, you always want to play and you will make that decision to play because you want to play. Has to use the example of when Walter all jabbing in the toilet because he didn't want to miss a game. We have all done that, and that is, but that still responsibility lies on you. Because A, there are also lots of players who finish without ongoing injuries and are the lucky one. As has said, sometimes uh, at a club you can run out of you can run out of budget and everything else. But yes, you've got to try and hold the game to account in some way, but you are ultimately the, the, the person responsible for your own health. He did also say that, and, and at length, A, that he wouldn't change anything, and B, that, you know, it is the pact you make with the game. I'm just interested when you talk about him as England captain sticking his head above the parapet. Was there ever a point when you were England captain when you felt like sticking your head above the bar- parapet and didn't? I would have said I had ways of trying to make people reach the answer that we wanted, but whether it worked or not wasn't always the case. When I was England captain and boys were tired, I would try and get that across to the coaching staff. Quite a lot of the time that would fall on deaf ears. That's all you can do is push it across. And then if you lose on the weekend, you can go back and go, well, we told you we were tired and you still flogged us. We were like, do you think it's better now we're playing two games a week because of the coronavirus state, which is ridiculous. From an academy point of view, it's the best time to be in an academy because it's the only time you're, going, you're guaranteed to play uh, Premiership rugby, but that still doesn't help the ones who are going to have to back it up numerous times. And that, how is that good for modern rugby 
to uh, the modern rugby player if you talk about how important welfare is. There were some great bits in there, you know, taking contact out of, of the week. I mean, NFL haven't done that for years. NFL have not played, done contact in, in once you get into game weeks uh, for years and years and years. Why we feel the need that we have to do it. I know that there's a lot of marling and uh, uh, rucks and, and that we have to cover off, but that can be done in a technique way. And I, I think it's going to become a change. It's not just a change of coaches, but it's also a change of like owners and people who are looking down from a board side because if you don't do contact for a week and then a t- and you find out a team does do contact and you lose and you lose and they went well they did contact so they're probably sharper in the head like literally coaches get owners ringing them up going oh we gave you that day off where you went off and did a team day and then you lost the result is beside the point the process is to be helping the players and make them feel better about themselves and feel that they we might have lost for numerous different reasons on the weekend but. The actual week was really good. Why have Saris been so successful? And I know people are going, wage cap. Why have Exeter been so successful? It's because of how they protect their players. They don't do con- they don't do contact during the week, and they expect their players to deliver it on the weekend. And what do- not doing contact all week gives is a massive emphasis on, on emphasis onto the players. So you know, Jesus, they've taken it easy on us all week. We've got to go and make sure that we're physical when we go out there. I don't know how much more of Dylan's book you've read. Ask, but it's it's very it finishes with a with a very strong viewpoint on Saracens, um, not not in the positive. I read it a lot of it this weekend. It is a very very interesting story, and the only thing I can kind of sort of say is I wish I'd been able to read that book at the beginning of his career because I think that that would which obviously doesn't work, but it really left me thinking from a sort of a, a journalist media perspective that understanding the person is often so useful for telling the story of everything that they then do i think also everything in the book is also overemphasized but again yeah you know when he talked when he talked about how hard eddie pushed him eddie pushed him if he didn't want to do it he wouldn't have done it and he wouldn't he wouldn't have the england career he might not have had the england career he had and he might have you know someone else jamie george or whoever might have taken over if he hadn't wanted to do it so of course he wanted yeah. to do it he just had to push himself to that limit to get there now I still go back to that is his decision to do and and you know has talked about how much training he did but you know before everyone got to breakfast and you have to respect that but you can't then can't look back and go well that's why my why my career is short because of my knee and everything else but you wouldn't have had it without you being yeah. pushed into that and then you wanting to do it it is a very good read and the sense I got reading it is that there aren't many more books like that left in rugby because it is an old school story you know growing up in Rotorua backpacking to England age 16 and then going on to lead, lead, lead England. So it's an extraordinary story in that regard. And Hask, we're getting competitive about show ratings. It'll be very interesting to see how the Hurt compares with what a flanker. Can I just say one thing about the um, the, the, the situation with, with Dylan and actually the, the show last week, because I think sometimes when, when we come on here and we put the podcast out, people see micro clips of our discussion points. It can sometimes see as like we're maybe potentially bashing rugby or saying there's a, there's yeah. a negative side to rugby. I... I Firstly, I wouldn't change anything, and I love rugby. And rugby, you can't make rugby safer, you can't make contact games safer, you can fiddle with it, but you'll destroy, the, you'll destroy the essence of it. My point was, when we came up with a specific topic about injury management, that's where we threw all our, our, our eggs into that basket. We're talking quite, quite frankly about it. And I think there's a bit of a misunderstanding between fans and people about, you know, that we had there's a couple of other players who came out in the media and, and like you know, Tins is one where his body is his, his body's okay. Now did he did he not commit himself to the game? No. Did he did he did he was he very physical? Yes. Did he do all the stuff that we've all done? Yes, he did. There's some older players that came out and chimed in and, and what what holds any progress back in any area of life, but especially in sport, especially in rugby, is the polarisation of opinions, but also the unhelpful opinions. And what I tried to do when we had those conversations was to flag actually, look, there are probably as Mike hit upon changing some of the contact training looking at some of the the rest weeks looking at the methodology to recovery understanding that you know four sessions a day three sessions a day in pre-season is probably not going to be optimal doing more is not necessarily better we have all this sports science sports science do we utilize it properly and that's always been my my concern but i absolutely love rugby and you know i i went and did a tv show last week and the, the guy was interviewing me and he said can you make rugby safer How, you know, what would you say to young players should young players stop doing contact it's like listen 
You can't, you know, it's like you can't make boxing safer, you can't make cage fighting safer, you can't make a contact sport safer. I wouldn't want to. You just under, need to understand that there's probably a bit more education around recovery, looking after your body. You know, if someone had said to me, could I put into an insurance fund, uh, you know, when I was playing and have some of my salary off, so when I finished playing, I had a pool of money to look after my body and had someone like myself come back in and talk to players and say, oh, by the way, lads, you've got Mike Tyndall here who's, who's actually relatively fine you know his body doesn't he's not too bad you've got me on the other hand he's struggling to walk you've got david flatman who piped up and said he had to stop because his elbow seized elbow up i think it's because he wanted to ginster slice off the petrol <laughs> station and his wife and his wife saving, let him saving for the post post retirement yeah. ginsters flats reckons that he knows all the services down the motorway between which one's got kfc which one's got mcdonald's <laughs> and so so i think there's just a little bit of education around that i, I think one point is where you said about two games a week so when I heard about that, I thought, wow, that's mental. You know, two games a week, we talked about player welfare. Turns out player welfare and science goes out the window when you need to finish a season. So I was going to go along that path of like slagging it and saying everything else. It's madness. I spoke to a few lads and they are like, this is amazing because we don't do any training. All we do, we play a game, we come in, we have one meeting, we, we walk, do a walkthrough, we go home, we're done by one o'clock at lunchtime. And we fuck off and then we come back and play the next day. I was like, this is, this is brilliant. Obviously, it's not sustainable. I'm not advocating it. It is complete madness shoehorning those games in. But what I thought when I first spoke to lads was like, I'm going to be retiring by the end of this, this season, cramming two games a week's impossible. What teams have actually discovered is you don't need to do contact training a week. You don't need to spend all day doing meetings. You don't need to be there from seven in the morning to five in the afternoon. Do you know what? We can finish. So hopefully the other side of this madness, if we don't have an increase in injury rates, we get through all this nonsense and it never happens again. Some teams might suddenly realise they were doing way too much and didn't need to. If you think about it, Hask, a Tuesday would be like a full game anyway. I don't know whether it's the same now. Obviously, I, I 2014 I was out and you were out in, what, 2018? If Tuesdays were still the same in 2018, it's a double day and mainly a double contact day. So that is a match day. It might not be 90 minutes long, but sometimes, for some reason, as it's been through the history of rugby, is when you play against your fellow teammates, you go harder. I don't know why that is. If you could lose that day, you, you know, even if you just lost the Tuesday in terms of it just being a technique day rather than, you, know, you look what you know, videos I've seen of Saris where they, they have crash pads. And if you want to do tackle technique, it's on the crash pads. So you're just minimizing all impact. That is what's needed to protect careers. And then you just go hard on a Saturday and that's where the contact side comes in. And that's what you sign up to. I want to fly through a few other bits and bobs before Mar joins. Uh, although I do want to say, I think Hask. I love rugby t-shirt is on its way. It's a bit like Brick Tamlin, I love lamp. I mean, just the, the things we never thought we'd hear Hask say. I've, j- I've just realised merch I've got, in there. I've got the shittest end of this deal, haven't I? Being the fucking rugby. Because lose. no one wants that. Who is, who is going to go, I want to be the rugby? No one. No, who wants to be the Norse? Alex, uh, Alex. We're Alex. 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 He'll buy one yeah. just so yeah, he just rugby. I'll buy one of your t- t-shirts. I mean, you were fighting for the rugby and I was like... Well, I don't I, care I, what I, I am. I'm <laughs> happy to be left right out. It's really not, you know, Tins, if you want to swap, you can swap. Owen Farrell's tackle um, has... This is a, a question about... Uh, what happened at the weekend rather than your, your friendship with him uh, thoughts well firstly I, you know, I, I was like when I saw it I was like oh god he's got, that, he's got that horribly wrong you know he's come across line speed he spotted a player you know he spotted a young player I thought you know like just um, by the way I'm not belittling this by the way but I've got to put a bit of humour into everything Charlie He's, Atkinson, uh, six yeah. months out of school for rugby. That's what I mean. So I saw that. Firstly, I was like, fuck, what's Owen he's done wrong? He's got that completely wrong. He's killed the bloke. Then my old school head went, oh, that child Atkinson's come out of school. He's like, this is wicked. I'm playing Saracens. I've caught a high ball. Boom, I'm going to step back in. Owen Farrell's seen him from a mile away and gone, get back in the change room, you academy bastard. But I actually, apparently Charlie Atkinson is a really lovely guy. And obviously Owens will, will be mortified because he 100% didn't mean to do that. I think he got it wrong. I think if you see Atkinson's got the ball, he's looking to go well and he steps back in. Owen was too high and uh, obviously it's going to be a ban. You know, there's no way that he, I knowing Owen that he would go and do that. He probably got his tackle technique wrong. I know people have criticised his tackle technique before. When you're an edge player... It's a very hard double. It's a very um, hard thing when some of that defence has won, won us games, and some of that defence has cost us games. And I think there will obviously have to be an adjustment in his, in his technique. I was just a bit shocked by that, cause, just because it was like a moment of madness. But it wasn't helped as he stepped back in. Um, and apparently, as I said, I, I wanted I wanted the, the academy kid to be an absolute rater. But apparently, he's really lovely as well. So it's. But I was just a bit old school. I was like, ha ha, you know, welcome to rugby. <laughs> the Twitter reaction has has been pretty vociferous which is a surprise Charlie Morgan who I think you know one of the best young journalists out there um, 
borrowed a stat from Russ Petty, who is, uh, I mean, just all over all the numbers. 87 tests for England and the Lions, Owen Farrell's played. Two yellows, 33 penalties, which almost sounds like an afternoon's work for you, Hask. And then Charlie gets called a dildo. The whole thing gets blown out of proportion. Everyone's kind of crucifying Owen. Why is he a character who sort of attracts this? It's great to hear, because I actually was going to message Russ on Twitter to find out and I was like, it's too hard to figure out how many penalties he's given away for high tackles or how many... He's given um, away 33 penalties in tackle incidents so, in 87 tests for so, country and the Lions. I was reading some of the Twitter stuff and they're all saying he's deserved it. No, he doesn't deserve it. He doesn't deserve it, right? Only because people perceive he, that he, how he tackles is incorrect. Yeah, every time that it, people perceive it, the referee hasn't seen it that way. So these people don't know as much. Yes, he's borderline. On the weekend, he got it wrong. And he got it wrong for different reasons because what he does is he stands really tall. When you're tackling, and if you come from a rugby league background, generally, and some, I'm, I'm sure I'll get shot down for saying this, but and Dennis Betts always said, you need to stay upright for as long as possible before you make your hit because that will allow you to get your feet as close to the tackler, uh, the person you're going to tackle. A problem Can is I just add, this like, is Dennis Betts who was defence coach at Gloucester with you. This isn't just yes. a sort of, yeah. It's yeah, context. That is how we defend. So when the South Africa ones, obviously I'm on a big South Africa, the Smutbees, shout out to the Smutbees who are listening. They go mad at him every time because most of the time he's made those big hits. He stands really tall and drops at the last, last split second. And sometimes he does get as low as people would like him to go. But in the letter of the law, he has come off on the right side of it. With that tackle on the weekend, he should never be that high because that guy doesn't see him coming. His eyes have lit up. I, I can end this. I can absolutely smash it. I know exactly what he's going through his mind. It's, that is your best tackle. Go running across field. He doesn't know you're coming. But if you're going to do that, you have to set your body height way low. Because he, he's not going to step you. He's only going to step into you, which means his height would drop. So he just got it completely wrong. And it w- was reckless because he should know better. He's in a really strong position into that tackle. And that he should just be lower. Because even if he steps in and he hits him at rim height, he's, he's absolutely folding him like a deck chair as as Hask would say. I'll say firstly as well, because you know, I, we do always joke and have a little bit of tongue-in-cheek thing. You know, that was a very dangerous tackle. The bloke yeah. was lucky. It, you know, it was a complete, a complete you know, F up in, in every, every area. The one thing that concerns me with all these things is, is you genuinely telling me that Owen Farrell decided on his own volition to run out of the line, take some kid head off, get a red card, for what reason? So when everybody throws these sentences out or people tweet things just to get more followers just to get into a dialogue i have made lots of mistakes i mistake make mistakes every day everybody does rugby as a game or any sport would not flow without errors being made let's understand there is a big difference between someone elbowing someone in the face coming over the right head and someone getting a tackle badly wrong there is no doubt he needs to work on his technique. You know, he plays on the edge. And as I said, the edge has won us games. The edge has cost him a lot of penalties. As a, as a, as a 10, you know, one, one of the hardest things I, I've always said is tackle technique is, is very hard and very difficult to, to nail because it takes a lot to dive at someone's knees. That's why I always had such admiration for a, a Joe Worsley or, a, or, or, you know, a Lewis Mead or whoever it was because they used to take people out, out of the knees. Yes, there's got to be some adjustment. And in this modern game, in the, in the way it's refereed for safety reasons, else, you can't afford that. And the mind Margin for error going above the, the, the stern and upwards is a very risky play. If I was playing now, I would go for the legs. I got it wrong. I took Jamie Roberts' head off. They're still trying to find yeah. it down the A16 in, in Richmond. Albeit the fact that Jamie Roberts' head and chin are so big, it's difficult not yeah. to miss it. Yeah. <laughs> I just think that I just think that people who get criticized and come at people like Owen, it's it's such a personal attack, and there is absolutely no context. And I think you need to have a long, hard look at yourself. And it's also, just as I said with the injury stuff, people piping up going, well, I, I've never been injured. And, oh, when you, you know, the game's gone mad. Everyone's so much bigger. That's why your body's erect. It's like, no, that's not why it's gone wrong. Stop fucking pointing fingers. And, fa- and, and journalists, just saying it so everyone go, but also coming at him as a personal attack. Yeah. I know Owen intimately. He's mortified about doing that. Yeah. And he would be very disappointed in himself. You're telling me that he did that so he, doesn't, so he can't play for England or he's going to let himself down and open himself up to criticism. It's absolute bollocks. And whoever you on social media, people who follow this podcast, let's... Let's say that people who follow Good, Bad and Rugby, we don't entertain this bullshit because we've got a lot of followers. I mean, I know someone else said that they've got the biggest down and rugby podcast in the world. You haven't. You're talking <laughs> shit. We have. But lads, just listen. I love all these players. I'm not on a personal, uh, uh, all these commentators and people, I'm not on a personal attack, but let's see our, let's keep our side of the street clean. Let's cut out this, this personal attacks. Let's go, oh, that was bad. 
let's see what happens. Especially someone like Owen, who clearly plays his heart on his sleeve and would never want to get a red card and certainly wouldn't want to kill a young academy lad and, and risk his health. My favourite bit in that was the way you went and F up and then just unloaded a top. We're keeping our side of the street clean. Right. Let's keep our side of the street clean. <laughs> That's Hask's language, Barry. He's, he's slightly on the high tackle, but he's trying to drop his body height, but he hasn't quite got exactly, there. Yet. Exactly, exactly. Georgia apparently into the eight nations. Good or bad? I think it, it's good for rugby. We've always wanted them to sort of step up and everyone's always talked about them being a possibility of taking over from Italy. So it gives them a great uh, sort of prime time viewing to go and, and show what, they can, what they're made of and what they can do. And I think the more that we can get to play a, a team like Georgia, who is up and coming and wants to embrace rugby, then the better it, but it can be. I think it's great. I'll tell you why. Because we, when we trained against Georgia for that, during that Six Nations, when all the scrum sessions, oh, yeah. the first scrum session they went down, they pulled out, everyone piled up, yellow card. After that, it was on like Donkey Kong. <laughs> so much so, Paul Gustard had to take me to one side and had to join in with the backs defence because some of the Georgians were like going full contact. And, and Paul Gustard went, ask, I need you to take that dude out. I was like, what do you mean? And he goes, it's touch. He's like... Nah, he's bullying the lads. You got to go. so I got seconded just to fly into someone to, to to fill him in. I think it's great for us. I think Georgia are physical. I think they've got some massive units. I think every session descended in an all-out war. You know, the last thing I when I was watching, you know, Courtney was in there. It it got it got heated. I think they're they're an up-and-coming nation. They are massive units. Most of the the good front rows in in the French game are from Georgia. You know, Kobe Yashvili, Yashvili-ish, yes, 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 Vili-ish, all of them. <laughs> I'm all excited and they are some big, they are some big lads. So I think it's great for, 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 for rugby and I think it's a step forward to help develop these other, other teams and give them a taste of what it's like. I'm not sure how the fixtures fall, but Georgia against Italy, if it does happen, and I hope it does happen, will be fantastic. And actually, we should try and get Mamuka Gorgodze on as well. Did you play against Gorgodze? Yes, I did. He is, was the ultimate machine i love that guy like there is people that you play in rugby and you were like mate he was one tough dude everybody you go anywhere he was like a machine so i would love to get him on because he's a legend of the french game every time you played him it was like he was fighting somebody somebody was fighting him he'd like just run over six people he was he was he was brilliant it's a bit like tom palmer he's definitely a serial killer behind closed doors yeah Um, yeah, yeah. yeah When we played Barbarians, he was he was always just sat. He always sat in the lobby by himself with a laptop with him. But he's he's, he's looking down at his laptop, but his eyes are always up, just surveying <laughs> yeah, what's yeah. going on. And you're like, what? Yeah. Who is he looking for? <laughs> Has he got a target? <laughs> Most of them were on the field because geez, he was wow, he was a unit. I like the idea of him drinking milk and sleeping in a sitting upright in a chair like Leon. <laughs> yes, yeah. you know he. Um, we know Wasps almost having him. a plant pot plant. Wasps tried to sign him actually it, uh, when I was there. They came, I think they tried to sign him as a replacement, but when they they scanned his knees and his knees were more bone than they were cartilage, so even <laughs> die die did wear up. He went, oh, Hask was a bit cash. This bloke's got no knees. It was a fifty. It was a fifty fifty, <laughs> but apparently he wanted too much cash. Your banter swung it through, did it, Hask? Yeah, knocked him out. North South game. In New Zealand at the weekend. I mean, you know, it's why they call it the game played in heaven. Did, did either of you watch it? Yeah. Yeah, mate. yeah, watched it. Proper good. Will Jordan, pff, mate, what a finish. Him yeah, and that yeah. George, is it George Bridge, they yeah. just scored for fun during that, the, the, the New Zealand at, at, at all. I don't know how to pronounce it, but I won't bother. They should do a three-game series. I think um, for the Hurricanes, I can't think. Unbelievable seven, best seven in the world uh, at the moment. Ardi Savia. Ardi Savia. Ardi Savia was like, yeah, it's got to make it a three-game a three game series. I'd love to see that. I felt a little bit sad for the North. If you look at their tries, how great their tries were. They were all just r- ripping people up on the outside and, and their ability to stay on their feet. So like, even that, that second try, like Damien McKenzie gets hit quite hard and the defender falls on the floor but he stays on his feet and he ends up getting the ball back and then and scoring that's what they're so good at is, is that support play and staying and their nines just work in the middle of the field have fun all day long but yeah I think the North would be a little bit upset when they look at the standard of their tries let's hope for a three game series I think that would be a lot of fun but obviously that game took place in Wellington and that is where we find this week's special guest yeah! Yeah, we-, <laughs> we described him last week as one of rugby's greatest rock stars one of the greatest 12s to play the game Mar Nonu it is an absolute pleasure to have you on the good the bad and the rugby how are you where, where in the world are you at this point I'm in uh, Wellington New Zealand mm-hmm. So yeah, back home. When you jump on Zoom calls, you generally look at what people's backgrounds are. Obviously, Alex has got this protein. There's either normally bookcases behind you or there's curtains. Now, they are curtains <laughs> that you've got behind you. Yeah, well, there's a bookcase here, but I don't want to show it. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, it's always difficult when there's only three Haskell books on there, isn't it? Um, how have you been? How's lockdown been? How how the last sort of the last few months been for you personally? What, what's been keeping you busy? Well, I, I left the states in in the March because of COVID, and then we were in lockdown for a couple of months, and that was actually good for us because you didn't have to leave the house. <laughs> uh, if you look at it this way, people complain about not getting a coffee or not getting takeaways and going to the cafe, but uh, at the end of the day, you got everything at home you need. You know, people talking about what they need when they leave the house, but initially, you know, you got everything at home. Have you quite enjoyed it? I don't have any babysitters, so I was up there <laughs> taking the boys out, but it was good. I enjoyed tell, the times. Tell Alex about the army of kids you've got, because I, I knew you when you first had, uh, uh, it's my, uh, my, Mercury. No, Michael was the first one, wasn't it? Mercury was the first one. Mercury yeah. was the first one. And then you had Michael, and then you've got, uh, who's the, is the oh, one more, isn't McLaren. it? Oh, the youngest, McLaren, yeah. McLaren. Wow. Oh, how old are they? Uh, Mercury's 11, uh, Michael's 8, and McLaren's 5. The best thing about Marl is that when we used to finish training at, at the Rico, all of us would be quite tired because we'll, we'll come on to how long the sessions went on. <laughs> and I'd be like, Marl, do you want to go for a coffee? And you'd be like, oh, I'm going to look after the kid. And then you'd be out there with Mercury for another two hours throwing a ball. And I'd just be like cycling past. You'd be right. It's like, ah, oh, I love kids. <laughs> As Mercury was like running around, it was very funny. So he's a, he's a very good dad, Marl, but he does... It's quite hard with three three boys and the food bills. That's why he's had more clubs than I have because you've got to keep playing <laughs> to fund three <laughs> ma- ma- massive lads. I enjoy it. So I'm still waiting for Hess to hit some kids. Yeah, uh, I think Hass needs to grow up himself he, before yeah, he, yeah, he brings yeah. his kids into the world. I was going to say Hass' life would have to not become about Hask for him to have kids. Uh, Hess, you got there's there'll be a time when um, it's not about it's not about you, you know. So well, what's the situation with your plane now? Are you going back out to San Diego? You got another another year with them? Two years? How long are you going to keep going? The, the plan is to go back to the Legion next year. So I haven't actually finalised uh, when I'm going to go back. So I'm just taking year by year. It's just you, not getting any not, younger. Do you not think 38 double World Cup winner? I've sort of done it. It's not actually about more money, really. Um, like... I still enjoy the game and I still enjoy competing. Um, you know, I don't I don't think I could play Super Rugby again. Um, I tried last season. Um, and I guess, you know, that it's getting more intense. Um, but the reason why I picked the US is to try and share my knowledge and uh, grow the game in the States. I want to ask you lots more about the Legion. You've got Chris Robshaw going out there as well, so it'd be interesting to, to set the scene for him. But I'm fascinated. When you say you couldn't play Super Rugby anymore, what is it that's gone in your game that means that that's the case? Well, if I, if I did get the opportunity, I, I could probably still compete. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, don't rule me out. <laughs> I, know, I know mentally I could, I, I could go there. It's just whether um, you know, my body can compete. But if I was given that chance again next year, I'll take it. But Would if you like I was the chance again? No, I, I, I want to go back to the States. There is so much to talk to you about, and it's a real pleasure to have you on the show. Eighth most capped All Black in history, 103 in total. Tins mentioned, obviously, a double World Cup winner. And we can go anywhere with this, really. But I'd, I'd almost love to go right back to the beginning with you, because we mentioned um, when introducing you, your All Black debut was against Tins uh, in Wellington. Fond memories of that game? Obviously, an All Black debutant, but um, Tins will be very quick to remind you of the result. I'll, I'll, I'll never forget that game. Um, it, it was a blur in my mind in terms of how the match uh, went because it was my first game and I was up from an All Black and I started. But um, you know, obviously, if you fast forward, England won the World Cup, and you know, people would say, "Oh, how, how did you lose against England?" But that was a champion team for 2003, and you know, we saw that. There's probably no other team that could have beaten them that year, and they had uh, two people in the in the bin. It was like the last 10 minutes that we were down to 14, uh, 13 men. But it was actually like, I think uh, Long got sent off in the four, in the, somewhere in the 40th minute. So it was just after half time. But it's amazing how your mind plays tricks on you and what you actually think that, that went on. I watched some highlights of it actually the other day with you coming on. And, and we, we just defended so well. We were literally just our scramble D. Because even though Carlos Spencer missed a few shots that go he was carving us up line break wise uh, that was why uh, Lol ended up getting sent off to go down 13 men for me to, to you know Mars first game and obviously I'd seen what he'd done in the Super Rugby that year and um, I went to have a chat with him after it but you forget that his first game All Blacks he was very very annoyed at losing his first game so he wasn't 
you didn't really fancy a chat straight after that game. <laughs> I was dropped after that, so I didn't uh, make another appearance for <laughs> another seven months. Am I right saying that, that you that you had been brought through by Tana Umanga at that stage? He's got this sort of revered reputation within the sport. I just wonder what it was like with, with someone like that as your mentor. Yeah, so me and T started that season with um, the Hurricanes. And I, I was just fresh off playing club rugby the year before, so I played a couple of good games for the club and then I was asked to go to a Wellington Lions camp and then I went there, played the pre-season game for them yet, but I was only filling the space because, you know, Tana was away with the All Blacks. Um, they had two players who were injured at the time. They had uh, Peter Alatini and Paul Steinmetz who was in the midfield. Obviously, the coach said, oh, you're not, you're not in the team. You're, you're just filling in and you're going to go back to the Wellington Colts. So I said, yeah, that's fine. I actually went back to the Colts um, the week leading up to the Wellington kicking off for the competition game and then I got a call on the Friday and they said, oh, you've got to come to captain's run, you're starting for Wellington against Canterbury. So and then from then on, I just didn't look back. It wasn't a bad bat line to, uh, to start your career off for that Hurricanes bat line, was it? We had, you know, Christian Cullen at the back. Um, Amazing. Big John Alomu on the left wing. You know, he was schoolboy idol when I was at college and um, you know we had uh, Lomi Pato on the other wing so we you know and Tana was at 12 so you know, I was looking around going man Hass, you must have watched Mar coming through I mean you were sort of in, in shorts and a, and a cap at that point I just I mean it, it, the stuff of dreams playing with that yeah. back line before I met Mar one of the reasons that um, I signed at the Rico Black Rams was, was when I turned up there and trained they said look we're going to we're going to sign Mar on it and for, for me I think and for a lot of kids of, of my sort of generation I think you know he, he has a cult status you know the the, the dreadlocks the, the occasional eyeliner maybe a little eyeliner every now and then bro and then um, you know he, and, and the way he played the physical nature, it was it was amazing. At school, we'd be running around playing, pretending to be Marnona, pretending to be Jonah, pretending to be these people. I mean, obviously, we're doing it very badly. I mean, I'm aware of my limitations. But um, so it's very exciting to actually meet him and find... There's almost two sides, Mark. Would you, would you say you've got two sides to yourself? Did you, did you finish school at 22? Because I'm not that older than you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm like, um, we actually finished at the same time. <laughs> Mate, you're a lot older than me. I'm only uh, 35, bro. The whole three years difference. But what I meant was is when you're an academy kid and you're watching, because you, you, know, you made your debuts and stuff er, earlier, you know, you, you'd see him playing Super Rugby, we'd, we'd be doing, you know, we'd be doing stuff at Wasp or doing whatever, because you had that, you have that presence. Well, the reason I asked you about two sides yourself is that I can see tonight we've got, we've got humble Mananu, but then we have, well, you've got three sides actually, because then you've got like lovely, friendly, and one of the most generous people I've ever met, Mananu, and then you've got that horrible, fierce competitor that comes out on the field, that just shut that comes down. Do you, do you think that's fair? Yeah, well, this is the first time on the show, so I have to um, you know, portray that. <laughs> that, um, that the, the fans deserve and the host. But if you hang out with me and Hess when we're in um, Kutaki Tamagawa, it would be totally different. <laughs> Remember what were your first impressions of Hask? I, I actually saw Hess playing um, for Stade Francais. Because when he signed for Rico, I, I had to look him up. And then I saw him. <laughs> <laughs> and Stay then, humble, uh, bro. Stay <laughs> humble. <laughs> Hess is, is a big, friendly giant, really. Um, you know, nicest guy, you know, when we're in Rico. And um, there were a few experiences in terms of funny sorts of experiences in the changing sheds. Um, when we used to do extras and go back to our changing grounds at, at Rico. So there were funny things that happen there but I mean <laughs> it's the BB gun story isn't it yeah it's the BB gun story which sticks out to my mind so you tell it man and I'll, I'll, I'll add some details well Hass is a big prankster anyway normally because all our workers are working you know like the Rico and we only had six foreigners so um, we would meet in the mornings and go to the gym and Hess is oh I'll ask Hess oh, what are we doing you know and he'll be saying oh let's do some turn and but he was throwing weights around, so I couldn't keep up with him. He was too strong. So I was just sticking to rehab, and Hess was just lifting big, big weights. And then we would go for lunch. Anyway, when we would go back, because we have all our locker rooms, and, um, you know, there'd be always uh, the Japanese cleaners, you know, sweeping the floor and mopping the floor. One day Hess comes in, and he's got a BB gun. And we're just sitting there, and then um, he starts shooting me. He shoots maybe one of the cleaners, I'm not sure, but. Um, he hides around the corner and all of us are like just pretending we didn't know what happened. But our backs coach comes in. He's walking around 
and then Hats shoots him in in the bottom. He shoots him in the ass, and then he turns around. He knows it's not us, but he's looking around anyway. With Hass's shot, he cuts his bum. Got a massive scar, and his bum starts bleeding. And then he's going upstairs, and he's into Lance. And then I think Lance comes down. That's um. That's his uncle who coached us. The guy was wearing waterproof trousers, right? You know, like tight waterproof trousers. And he was like, he obviously thought he was a bit of a fashion king. He was one of the lads. So as he's walked up the stairs, I was sitting, Mars on my right, and there was a barrel, like an empty barrel. And the Japanese guys, a lot of BB guns are manufactured in, in Japan. So a lot of the kids had them. I'd found this like, unbelievable gas one. I was like shooting everybody. And as the bloke's gone up the stairs, and I've shot him in the arse, it's like, you know, if you take like a, you took like a BB gun shot or a paintball, you're like, ah, like, and you get on with it. This guy was like this, ah, ah. Uh, for, for, for honestly, for like 15 minutes, like he wouldn't go upstairs, and then and I dropped the gun in the barrel. Mars like this. Everyone's looking around. Mate, the guy's gone up to the sink and got a bit of wet tissue, pulled his things down, and he's like, ah, ah, mate. It was so embarrassing. And it was like, uh, all, you know, apart from the time that I punched someone in the face in training, I don't know if Mar remembers that, when everybody, all the old players came up to me, I had to have seven separate meetings with different members of staff because. The Japanese don't aren't aren't very violent, right? So you don't have that kind of stuff. But they they square up, but they don't ever do anything. And in a session, this prop squared up to me, and as soon as he went like that, I went boom, punched him. Everybody went mad. Like Mar came, up, was like, "Has what have you done? What have you done?" I was like, "What do you mean?" He goes, "Mate, they are going mad." I had to meet the coach, the, the forwards coach, the head coach, and then the, and then the, the next guy was basically telling me off via translator, saying, "Look, you know, if you did that in a game." <laughs> you're going to get a red card. And the translator was shouting at me. And I honestly went, love, can you calm down? Because he's the one that's angry. Why are you like, she would have got an A, an A-level GCSE drama, sorry, A-level drama for, for that performance. But mate, it was, it was pretty crazy. But that, when I shot the guy, there was a big inquiry, but they never, they never knew who it was. And I don't think the coach works anymore because he had to retire because of a broken bottom. Proof that international superstars are still very large boys at heart. Do you remember that time that you stitched us all up with that when we lost our like third game in a row in that meeting and you decided to tell everyone that we were going to sing a song? No, I can't remember that. Ma walks into the meeting room and he's like, Hask, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. It's like, Ma, no, no, do what he says. He's like, yeah, Ma, what? And he goes, I tell you what, I'm sick of these meetings. We watch a load of videos. No one gets told off. I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to sing a song. And he said to all the foreign boys, we had like Tamati Ellison, Roy Kenny, Kenny Lau, Mikey Broadhurst. And he said to everyone, Mark Lee said, right, we're going to, we're going to sing a song. Like this. We're going to sing Three Little Birds. Because that's all Mar. Mar used to just walk around singing Three Little Birds to himself or um, just uh, singing Michael Jackson songs. So I said, okay, if Mar wants to do it, we'll do it. So he says something to the coach. The coach goes to translate, translates to the head coach. And then the meeting goes quiet and they say, um, before today's meeting, we have a special um, presentation from the, uh, the foreign players uh, they'd like to send up. So Mar gets up and he elbows me, so I'm up with him. All the other foreign players are head down and he starts singing Three Little Birds, but we only knew the first verse. And honestly, we're like, <laughs> <laughs> don't worry about a thing. Right, and we're doing all the actions. All the other foreign lads have turned down. We got halfway through it. And then we're just like, this is the most embarrassing thing we've ever been involved in. Sat down and all the Japanese, because they're so polite, were like, that was brilliant, lads. So I never listened to Mar ever again. But it was almost, do you remember how bad that was? You stitched me up so badly. I can't remember. Ah, come on. Redacted from the memory bank. I can't remember losing the game. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's absolutely, are you a man of music though? I mean, is that, is that a big part of your life? Nah, well... Yeah, I listen to tunes, but I'm not kind of like the guy that downloads songs and I'm not that guy that, you know, thinks I'm a DJ or, you know. <laughs> I hate that guy. When we used to go away for games, I used to hear, Hess used to stretch outside his room and listen to Michael Jackson. That's you! Stop! <laughs> mate, mate. Honestly, we wake up in a small little room, right? So Christmas Day, so for example, Christmas Day, we were playing an away game against Panasonic. And we're in a tiny little Japanese hotel, right? Small, tiny little beds, miso soup, cold fish and white rice. And he just says, booms and guns and booms and guns and boom, boom. You'll come out and think, he, Christmas Day, he's got a band on in his lycras. All, all my used to wear shirt off lycras. Just no way. No boom, way. Boom, lunging, oh, stretching. Uh, he used to scare all the Japanese boys. They didn't want anything to do with him, terrified him. He's telling his own story, guys. 
<laughs> I'm getting very dizzy. This is turning into quite a competitive little uh, set two, which I'm loving. Tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give. I'm going to. We're going to have a thirty second break. I'm just going to do the mid show trail, and then I want to get into something a bit more than than Michael Jackson and, and Hass's <laughs> recycled stories. We are going to talk about winning not one but two World Cups. One of only twenty people to have done that, and discover. Uh, by now, the inevitable answer to the question, what did you really think of Hask when you first met him? But you are listening to and watching The Good, The Bad and The Rugby with me, Alex Payne on 21 Six Sport, alongside Hask, The Lord and the all-black legend, Martin Nonu. Don't forget, you can sign up to our social media sites, which thousands and thousands of you have done. We've got lots of debate going on there. And it's also where you're going to find all the information about the show, upcoming guests, special events, and a whole host of great content that we have got for you. You can check out the Q&As of both Hask and Tins, which were a lot of fun. And we've got something special starting this week as we wel uh, welcome to the team our new member. And that member is the Noors. Uh, we're going to have a little section of the website for you moving forwards as well, where the Noors will be able to give you all the pub ammo that you need. Um, we will be able to set him challenges. We're hopefully going to take some of the great content that you as our readers and viewers are producing as well um, and select the best of that and, and stick that into Noors Corner. And generally, the Noors will hopefully provide a little bit of detail and a little bit of rugby uh, to sit alongside most of the rubbish that the three of us put together. So welcome to the Norse. Please make him feel very welcome. Just type in good, bad and rugby across social media. We are very easy to find. Picking up on that really, Mark, are you, would you call yourself a student of the game? Do you watch rugby when you're not playing rugby or are you someone that likes to get as far away from it as possible when training's done? Oh, sort of half and half. If it's, if it's on the telly, I watch because my boys want to watch the footy. So I, I tend to try and let them watch, but... I'm not trying to sit down and try and watch the whole game. Will you stay involved in the game post hanging up your boots? Do you want to coach or do you want to you know, get into administration? Do you want to get you know, help um, young players coming through? I'm actually coaching in Wellington right now. So I'm ah. helping my club side out, help my boys' teams out, and I'm coaching a girls under-15 team at the moment. So wow. we've got a big game tomorrow coming up against the Wellington champs. So How are the girls getting on? Yeah, they're going well. Well, yeah, we've lost one out of six. But they're, they're good because they just they just get into it, you know. You yeah. put them through fitness and some of their plays, but no, uh, you know they they turn up and and get it done. You've played under some of the best coaches in the world. What's what's your style? Well, Wayne Smith's my favourite. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed Smithy uh, because my, he spent a lot of time with me uh, early on in my career. You know, in terms of trying to upskill me. You know, the likes of I had a, a lot of setbacks. When I was in New Zealand trying to trying to crack the All Blacks, you know, I was in and out, in and out the first five years, and then um, pretty much only in 2008 where I cemented my spot. I I didn't look back. Uh, I was just going to ask because obviously having played opposite you for for a vast amount of my career, and then obviously what you then went on and, and did in 2011, 2015. How did you see your your progression? Because you know, if I'm honest, sort of I saw you. When you first played, there's a bit more just a physical presence that if we could stop you, then we could we could nullify you. But then towards the end of your career, even when I'd finished, the little subtleties that had come into your game, how stronger your offload game is, it, you were so much sharper on just recognising, handling opportunities, two and threes down there. And your kicking game sort of went just went on an upward trajectory. Was that all down to sort of Smith and him recognising that there's always work-ons and there's always things to do better? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I wasn't the complete kind of player uh, in terms of a midfielder. You know, when I first started, I, I started out on the wing and then I was slowly pushed in. But um, skill-wise, I was terrible at passing off my left side when I first started. So all I did was truck it up. And my first year was good because I had Tana on the inside. You know, all he did was uh, tell me when to come short or go wide. or And it was just all about my timing onto the ball. So and that was me at 13. And then I had to learn year after that to try and defend at 13. But I had an absolute shocker in 2004. And that was the hangover of having my first year playing Super Rugby, first year in the All Blacks. And because we had a great side, you know, you could kind of hide behind all the other players because all you had to do was one job. And that was, for me, was just running. And then next year after, it was all about trying to get better. So obviously 2004 wasn't great. I was sent to the sevens to try and get fit. And then I had to work my way back in. There were a lot better midfielders on earlier on when I first started. You know, they had Aaron Major, you know, Luke McAllister come into the scene. Tana was still there, prominent, because in 2005, that's when the Lions came and he was the captain. So it was hard to try and crack 
the top side. But in doing that, I went back to the Māori Ten Cup and that's where I started learning. And in 2004, that's when me and Conrad started playing together as a combination for Wellington. You know, and it was Wellington, Hurricanes, Wellington. And it was 2004, 2005, 2006. So we had to work that partnership. And it wasn't until 2008 when we came together. It was five years later. How did his role with you in forming a combination in terms of understanding each other, did he also then, was it a conversation about him letting you know what he needed, you letting him know, and then complimenting each other off the back of it? Man, we made a lot of mistakes in the Mighty Ten Cup. You know, we, we missed um, all sorts in terms of, you know, getting broken through. And, you know, guys were going on the inside, outside, and it was just trying to work that combo around. And we would always work together at training, um, you know, our passes, our communication. And we'd always work on trying to know where each other were, you know. When we started playing for the All Blacks together, um, it got better and better because we kind of knew each other. And in that case, we were trying to upskill. You know, he was trying to learn how to kick. I was trying to learn how to kick. Um, and I was learning on firm defensively because, you know, he was that 13 that would go, look, he could actually stand, you know, 20, you know, me and you as a midfielder, he could stand 20 metres away because I knew I had to get to his inside shoulder and it, and it took me two, three seconds to try and get there. So if I told him, you know, if we had someone on the other side and he was a bit quick, I would say, don't stand too far because it'll give him too much room to go, you know. So I always had everything on his inside. He wouldn't have to turn around. And he wouldn't have to actually, actually turn in to take my man because he would know. It was just stuff like that, you know. And then we would commentate each other and, and we'd all, we would always split, as you know, on midfield. We would always split. He would have that side, I had, I'll have the other side. Comms would always come in from the wing, so and that's how it worked out. Yeah. You hear a lot about um, partnerships in sport where it's built on respect but not necessarily friendship. Are, are you close with Conrad off the field and did that help? Yeah, no, nah, we, we keep in touch now and we joke around and like, we know each other. And, um, you know, every time I need help, I would ask him and he would ask me. He's still in Poe now coaching. And I, I saw him last year, actually, when he came to Auckland. And I was just doing the preseason for the Blues. And he was like, well, mate, what are you thinking? I said, oh, you know, I have to have a go. So we were just talking about, you know, how he would, he's finished now. And I just said, look, I, I still got the drive, but I have to prove that I still got the goods. Because, you know, when you play at that level, you can't hide. Everyone's watching the games. and. You know, everyone got something to say and all. So, you know. It has been a remarkable journey. We, we joked earlier. I think, am I right to say you've played for nine clubs? I think, I think it's something like that. Not, and counting, we should probably add. Where did it all start? I mean, how, how did you first get... I mean, obviously New Zealand is, you know, the land and the home of, of rugby in many ways. But where for you did, did rugby begin? Well, it started here in Wellington, really, my local club, Oriental Rangatai, and it's affiliated to my college. So you play all your junior rugby there and then when you go to college, you play for school. When you finish college, you go back to the club. So it's just been the same, you know, my father played for the club, my two brothers, my two sisters, they played. Um, the two brothers played for the club, Julian and Artie Severe, and their father played. So my father played with his father. I played with his father. Now I play with the kids or, or, or the son. So we've all... It's kind of like a family club. Am I right? I know you're very proud of your Samoan heritage. Was it always the All Blacks? Was there ever a kind of a moment? Well, growing up, you know, primary school, I always wanted to play for Samoa. But it wasn't until, you know, the likes of when John Olomu came and I was like, man, you know, and then you get entrenched into the country because you go to all boys school at college and um, you're playing against different schools who are rivals and you can do the school haka against the other side and, and then the All Blacks is the team. You know, 1995, I was year nine and, you know, Jonah was the guy. And everyone at school was talking about him. He drove that dream for all of us to try and make the All Blacks. You were very close with Jonah, weren't you? Yeah, well, Jonah, um, he, he actually looked, lived up the hill from when he, when he came to Wellington to play for the Hurricanes. And when I made the Hurricanes, um, I was actually driving my father's van, you know, to training because we, we trained out in the hut it's about... 30 minutes away. One day he goes, oh, who's, you know, who's rides there? I said, it's my dad's. And he's like, oh, okay. So then the next day he came to my house. He's like, oh, jump in. I need a ride to the airport. I said, oh, yeah. I dropped them off to the airport and I said, oh, what do I do with the car? He goes, oh, I'll just use it for the weekend. I said, oh, okay. And I had it for nine months. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of, 
uh, quite a cultural thing as well with, with, with you guys in terms of, you know, because when I said earlier, you're, you're probably one of the most generous people I've, I've met. If It's fair to say that if somebody wants something from you, they, they can have it, isn't it? I think it's more, um, you know, family orientated. You tend to look after um, each other in terms of that aspect, you know, when especially you're in a team, if someone needs to borrow something, you know, you, you go, yeah, you can use mine. If you look at things material, um, materialistically, you know, nothing lasts really. What lasts is the friendship and, and the love you have for your brothers and your mates. Because you did tell me that um, when you came back to, um, I can't remember whether it was you flew back to New Zealand or Samoa, you, 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 your, your dad picked you up and he used to take you all the way around the long way around, past all the houses of all the other players. And he'd be like, oh, so-and-so's dad, uh, so-and-so's son's bought that, built that for their dad. And you would be like, oh, dad, every time. Is that is that true? When I made the, the, the World Cup in 2003, we were still living in a state house and... Um, my brothers had moved out and I was still in there. The World Cup was in Australia. So when we lost in the semi-final, there was a group of us that stayed an extra week to watch the final. Obviously, we went home after the Cup. But I got home and then I got a call from a real estate agent. And she's like, hi, I'm uh, Maria from, you know, from Eve. Uh, so my dad had actually got a house and said, oh, my dad, my son's going to pay for it. <laughs> so then we moved into the house like a month later. So that's how it goes, you know. I'm fascinated to know what it was like as a, as a kid with all the talent in the world, but you touched on it earlier, growing up, you know, coming through the ranks, not only with Jonah, but Tana, Christian Cullen, David Holwell, you know, players like that. I mean, did you always feel to the manner born? Were you always very comfortable in that environment or did you have to learn pretty quickly what it, what it took to live with guys like that? It takes a while. Like, you know, you, um, you're young and... Um you jump into the professional era. You're in, you're in the um, company of those players. And I always thought, you know, you know am I good enough? Or, you know, am, am, I, am I worth being here? When I started early on, when I got into the team, it was always like I needed to start performing and start playing so I could earn that, I, you know, I'm here for a reason. And I didn't want to just come in in just one year. So I had to, had to learn quickly. I didn't have all the many skills when I first started. I was lucky enough to learn my way, my craft during the whole time I've played rugby. Do you remember the mystique? And I mean, do you remember your emotions on becoming an All Black for the first time? And I suppose that, that, that of your family as well, actually. Look, it was, it was something surreal back in the day because you would find that on the radio back then. And uh, you wouldn't know until they announced the team. You know, there was no warning about, oh, you've made the squad. or It was relatively new for us. And I was Wellington born and bred. And, you know, I wasn't, I was nobody like about 12, min, uh, 12 months earlier. So I took it as it come and I had to just get into it quickly, really. And um, obviously I learned the hard way because we played England first up and we lost. Mark, did you see the most recent um, New All Blacks announcement and how emotional they, they were? Did, you, did that make you miss it? Did it make you reminisce? Because it, it, it kind of got me a little bit watching an, uh, a squad being put together again for the first time. It's the first time since I retired that I looked at it and was like, what an exciting thing it is to get called into your international squad and how much it means to the Kiwis. Because do you think it means more for you guys than, than anyone else? Every time I got selected, it was, um, I, was always, I was always nervous too, you know, when they announce it every year because you may be an incumbent one year and then then the next year someone else has come in. So you, you always have to perform every year. Um, you can't just look back on your on an old game. But I know for a fact, you know, when you get named in the team, it's always special. Even when you kind of know, oh, you're in the All Blacks, but to see your name on the list and to hear it being announced, that's it's always special being an All Black. And I missed it when I left New Zealand. When I was in France, um, you know, I, I couldn't watch the games because I missed it so much that, um, I, I still wanted to be a part of it. Did you leave too early, you think, maybe, to go to France? Do you think you, if you'd stayed, um, would you play more? I, no, I, I think I, I, le I left at the right time. You know, I was, I was 33 and um, I'd been in New Zealand for a long time, 13 years, and I think the timing was right. And in 2014, I actually broke my arm in the middle of the year. So, and the World Cup year was the next year and I hadn't re-signed and 2015 was my last year. So I was thinking, man, what should I do? Should I stay on or... And then it was in that time when I was injured, that's when we settled the deal with Toulon to go. Because I said, look, I've broken my arm and next year is the World Cup year. But I still got to make the team. So you didn't feel like no, there wasn't any unfinished business? You sort of feel like you left where you wanted it to be? Yeah, I think so. 
I think in my last year, I, I worked so hard during the preseason that I needed it to be uh, the last hurrah, and it just happened so quick. Do you, you still, know, do you still, when you're um, doing your stretching in your, in your lycra shorts, listen to Michael Jackson? Do you think about that try in the final? What a nice way to to finish off. No, I don't actually. I that that, that was something. I was just at the right place at the right time, I think. Oh, come on. Case. You've got to give us a bit uh, more than that. It, it's, it was uh, a worldie uh, and a World Cup final. Mate, that, that, you completed that rugby that day. What are you talking yeah. about? It was unbelievable. It, it was all down to Sonny Bill Williams. Everyone knows that. Anyone else, he would have popped the two, they would have scored. So. Well, yeah, there was a little bit to do. I mean, just a little bit from good. 50 metres out. It was a remarkable journey with the All Blacks. And, and you know, I think others will, will be able to testify far, far better. But, you know, you were one of the greatest teams to play the, the sport between uh, 2011 2015. I'm just interested in, in when you came through the ranks and you burst into it, how you uh, sort of felt stepping into the spotlight and how that then sort of, how you handled that pressure in 2011 when it sort of felt like, I'm, I'm told at Eden Park that at, at full time in the final, everyone just sort of exhaled in relief rather than celebrated the success. Do you know what I mean by that? Um, no, I don't. Good, <laughs> good, 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 good question. <laughs> But how did you, how did you was, find was, handling the, the well, spotlight? We talked about it for a long time in the country because we hadn't won the Cup for 24 years. And um, we had our chances. 1995 was, you know, one of the best chances. Yet we lost against the South African team who were just up here when they played. And, um, you know, Jonah had an outstanding tournament, but we couldn't get over the line. 99 again... You know, we lost to France. That was my senior year at college. So I, I, I watched that uh, tournament religiously and I, I was broken when they lost. And then, you know, I, I was actually at the World Cup in 2003. Played the first three games and then just seen it unfold. 2007, I didn't make the squad, but same again. You know, it was lost to France in the quarterfinal. 2011 was the year that, um, we had to make something happen because it had been 24 years. You know, the All Blacks hadn't won um, and it's in our country. Um, but that wasn't the sole fo focus of winning. It was just, it was always about the journey. As, as you've seen, Dan Carter got injured at training. So, you know, he went down and then we, we were set back in terms of finding a pivot to lead us to the finals. Obviously played Argentina and Aaron Cruden played. Oh, no, Colin Slade was starting. He got injured and Aaron Cruden came. And then during the finals week, we had to call in Stephen Donald. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, anything can happen. And if you, had, if you look back in 2010, we lost to the Wallabies in Hong Kong. And it was a moment where, you know, he had the opportunity to kick the ball out. It was like five or four minutes left and it didn't go out you know Curly Bill caught it on their 40 and then managed to break through get back on the 22 and then they had the ball for three three minutes and then James O'Connor scored the winning try obviously he kicked it but that game was solely based on Stephen Donner not kicking it out but we could have won that test match at any time but yet it was just that hangover was oh Stephen Donner Stephen Donner you know he wasn't even a looking during the whole year and then we filtered down all the tens started falling over and then he was the last port of call i remember him coming during that week and i was like man how awesome is this guy come in but at no point we, we we thought let's think about the final let's think about winning it was just like living in the moment it was tuesday the finals on the weekend you know and he just worked his way into it and if you look at the final he couldn't even fit his jersey so he was trying to pull it down and then uh you know he kicks the, the goal that gets us to eight points and then the rest is history. And then now there's a movie. Kick. It's called The Kick. Uh, so <laughs> recommend uh, watching it. Uh, obviously, when England lose to a specific oppos opposition, like New Zealand, seem to, France, France have always been claimed as that New Zealand bogey team. Leading into that week of that World Cup final, was, was that something that you were very aware of and that you knew that you had to put to bed? Obviously, you, you've highlighted the World Cups where they, they've ended New Zealand's dream. Was that in the forefront of your mind or was that, a, did you always have that ability to get, get that out? Because it's always something English media do to English teams. We played France in the pool stages. So we, we beat them comfortably at Eden Park in round three. Yet, you know, they obviously lost against Tonga in the last round and then filtered their way back to the finals. And then they beat England in the quarters. Yeah. And it was just like, 
you know, are we going to see them again? And then we did see them in the final. And history, was history repeating itself? We don't know. So, and the last, the first World Cup was 1987 and it was against France. So, you know, you could put all the theories together, but we're grateful and happy we were on the other side. We won, yeah. but it could have it could have went either way. It's funny, isn't it? Because obviously, you've, you've, when did you feel that you knew with that team? Obviously, you've been involved on and off since 2003. When did you know how good that team was? What? When we, you know, if we, if we look at that 03 team, I, I always say that the moment was beating South Africa in 2000 where we knew we could beat some hemisphere teams because obviously New Zealand always is a great team. But when did you know that you were part of probably the best team that's 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 played rugby in ever? Probably for us, we, we never thought about that, you know, we didn't we didn't think, oh, we will the greatest side, we, we thought about, our mindset was always about performing every test match. I think in 2011, we weren't that kind of a complete side. We were just coming on the back of 2008 building, 2009, 2010, and then 11. It was almost like those next four years was like, look, can we, can, the question is, can we do it back to back? Trying to prove to ourselves that we we're actually, you know, I can be a great side. And I think we saw that in 2013 when we, we were undefeated that year. You know, that, that was one of the achievements, you know, we could look back and go, man, we, we didn't lose a game. I've always wondered, um, you guys as New Zealand, you know, do you spend all your time just focusing on, on yourselves and what you're going to do as opposed to what the opposition are going to do? We focus on the opposition as well. But we, we didn't, um, well, there's, there's always a balance to footy. Like, people think... You know, we were, we're stuck in the computers looking at analysis. We're doing plays. And everyone in the team's got a rugby brain. So you're almost like breaking out into groups and getting everyone's feedback on what footy's about and what they know. And then you would ask questions and all the minds are working. It wasn't just, all right, come, guys, this is the plan. Because the reason I ask that is that when, I, when I've been, you know, when I've been with England, we, we say, for example, we've been playing New Zealand. We spent so much time trying to either play like you guys or, or talk about playing like you guys. Yet when I've played against New Zealand sides and we've done some post-match stuff, I swear the players have got, some of the Kiwi players have got no idea who their, who their oppos- opposition is because they are focused on themselves and what they're going to do in the game. And I, I used to think that was arrogance. I used to think, being the fucking Kiwis. That, but then I, I actually went the other way and I was like, I love that. I love the fact that, yes, you probably do your analysis, but you're so much more focused on what you guys are going to do, how you're going to play, your collectiveness, that it seemed to bring you real success. I mean, I don't know what you, if there's any truth in that or, or I've got it wrong. Yeah, you, you're right in some aspect. But we, we don't actually, you know, look at the side and go, oh, he's, he's a prop, he's, and then try and study every single individual. You're aware of who you're playing, your opposite, yet our plan is to stick to... But, you know, this is what you guys do and um, your nine, you know, comes in the line early, he doesn't sweep or, you know, this guy here doesn't kick off his left. Little stuff like that, we, we have in the back of our minds, but we still got our plan. But when we do lose, it's like, oh, what did we get wrong? I remember, Brad, you were talent calling Courtney Michael Laws. And I think Dan Carter got done up in Scotland <laughs> once. He was asked in a presser, who's your opposite number this weekend? And it would have been... I can't remember who it was, but he said, oh, we, we don't really focus on the opposition. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it, it, it's a stick that you've been beaten with before, I suppose. But the, the, the question I was going to ask is, is about the 2015. I think, am I right to say there were five Test Centurions in that group? It was you, Dan Carter, Richie, Tony Woodcock, Kevin Mayalamu. Obviously, it's a hell of a core group of players that. But what was the thread that sort of, you know, united you all in that, in that regard? And I'd love to know more about your relationship with... Richie and Dan, and you came through together and achieved so much together. Was there, was it just a sheer will to win? Was there, was there another aspect of that relationship which was integral to the success that you had? Well, I think everyone played their part. You know, we, we had been through a lot together over the years and, you know, we, we always knew the back of our minds about our setbacks. We would always, I think our, 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 what we always wanted to get out of ourselves and each other was always performing, always performing when it comes down to playing. You know, always performing at that next level. Yes, we wanted to win. That was the outcome. But how do we get there? We always needed to perform at a high level every single time. Even when the pressure came on, that was our, our sole focus. Um, it's interesting you talk about the pressure. Did you all handle that pressure 
in the same way or were there very differing reactions? Did some people kind of doodle and scribble and take it very easily and other people get very nervous and very intense in that group? Yeah, you know, you just let every single individual handle it, you know, how they wanted to. We would have set cores and uh, what would happen in the game because normally um, if someone loses it upstairs, then you, you could tell. They would give away a penalty or... You know, run out, run out with the ball or kick it out on the full. Everyone makes mistakes, but it's that next level where you can keep calm. Some players would go over and strangle other players to the ground, you know, like get Joe Marla and Scranton. Yeah. <laughs> when he gets, when he gets <laughs> sprayed with water. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, you're just going to get it. But we just have to stay in control. You know, those, those high pressure moments, you just keep calm. How much progress do you feel you made over the course of your career in that aspect, in the mental side of the game? Massive, massive leaps and bounds. Early on, I, I, I had a short fuse where, you know, I would hit someone high or, you know, obviously get a yellow card. And that was my game because I, I just wouldn't think, you know, I would hit someone. But when it came down to when I started playing for the All Blacks, I couldn't do that. I don't want to let anyone down. I don't want to let the team down. I don't want to give a silly penalty away. And um, You learn to control you know when you're in a team like that together you know obviously there's now books written on the the new zealand culture now you look at people who are quoting it jürgen klopp uh as i mean would you ever have thought that and were you conscious that that is what you were trying to build as a culture or was that just it just naturally flowed for you as a group but now it's you know there's books written on it there's um you know klopp's putting into his premiership title win that he was reading this book and I was just wondering whether that was a focus or whether it was just it just flowed naturally for you as a group. I think it just flowed naturally, really, because everything that you portray outside, it's 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 everything you learn at home. As I said before, with staying home, you know, you you learn everything at home. So it's so important when I'm coaching and I talk to most of the parents. So I coach my sons under twelves. When we're in a huddle, I always tell the parents, "I'm like, look, help your kid, help your son, help your daughter," because you know, we might not be the heroes that, you know, they want us to be. It's your mum and dad. It's what you learn at home. You know, that's how the kids grow up. And for us as All Blacks, you know, we had that traits where you go, you know, you have duty teams and, you know, clean up the change room after yourself and do this and, and bobs. And those little successes accumulate to how we are as a team and how we behave. Do you think, Ma, you were a controversial All Black? Well, I don't think I was, but... Everyone thinks I am. Why? Oh, I don't know. It's just I played the way I played early on. But, you know, when I, over my career, I started thinking people can only judge me on the field because that's where I did most of my talking. You know, the first five, six years, I wasn't the guy that was doing interviews. And then after that, the second half of my career, I started putting my, myself on media bands because everyone writes opinion pieces. You know that, Hask, because they can do that. But... I did my talking on the field and that was it. It's hard enough, but social media has changed the game of rugby because, you know, rugby players are not exclusive exclusive anymore. If you wanted to find out where someone was, you, you know where they are because they're posting it. And you can track anyone and everyone. And it's such a dangerous thing because um, we play the game because we love it. We don't normally play because we want the attention. We love We love footy. I'm, I don't really post on my Instagram, but I, I, I do have one. I, lo I, I love looking at Hess's pictures and his stories. That's not even the real story, Mar. That's, that's <laughs> what I just put out in the media because everyone can track you and find you. What I'm actually up to is very, is very different. Do you think it's a good thing, though, the social media? Do you think because do you think it's allowed people to see your different character? That's how um, society is. It's, it's the world we live in today. You know, I can say, oh, I don't like it, but, you know, it has its positives. But that's, that's the way of the world. But has it helped you? Because I, I said at the start of the show, I said there's three types, the three, I said there was two, but actually there's three personality types of Mark. I think, like, you know, you're, you're very humble, but you've got quite a stern demeanour. Like, you look, you know, like when you were playing, you look like an intimidating guy, but well, you're very kind and very generous and very lovely. Do you think with social media and you travelling to so many clubs has shown a different side to you, that you are different, you're not just a, a real aggressive guy? Well, I, I, I hope to think so with the people I've worked with over the clubs. But I wouldn't be the first to say, oh, this is me, I'm at this club, this is what I'm about. You know, I have a page where I may post two or three times a year about 
um, me and my kids, but I enjoy my life now. It, what's very interesting actually is it, it's, it's not just you. It seems to be quite an all black thing. Um, th- there is a definite reluctance to kind of put yourself out. I mean, Dan Carter has quite a well curated Instagram page. Uh, Richie sticks up the odd picture of him in a helicopter or climbing a hill, but it's it, as a, as a collective, you are, you are very united and, and quite reserved. And I just wonder, is that, is that just being part of an all black or is that a sort of a conscious decision as a collective and, and as a team that you were? We were we'll certainly um, ourselves in terms of who we are as people. You know, when we, when we came together as a team, it was one, it was one team was first and foremost. It was always about the team. You know, you had to give your best for the team. And yet there are some very different characters, I presume, amongst that. And there are some global superstars who you played alongside, you know, like Sonny Bill, um, I just wonder how the All Blacks were very good at allowing different characters to mould into one. Whereas the accusation, perhaps in England, is that if you stand out from the crowd, you don't you don't get a look in. Maybe you need to change your selectors. Yep, possibly. Who selects the England, who selects the England team? I'm more interested in how the All Blacks enabled not enigmas necessarily, but they enabled people outside the pack to star within it but also give them the, the, the freedom to be their own person. I think here in, in, in New Zealand, we, we didn't actually judge them as, as who they were. You know, there's a lot of great rugby players out there. And if you wanted to play for the All Blacks, you'd put your hand up. It seems to me in, in England, when you select the side or um, who you don't want to choose, it's, it's, always broadcasted over, it, it's always broadcasted over there. Mm. Oh, we don't pick him because of blah, 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 blah. And here in the country, it's... He does this, he does that, but is he good enough for the All Blacks? Yes, he is. He's, he makes a team. So I don't, I don't know how in England, which, how many people are there? 100 million? You know, you've got 5 million here. Yet we seem to beat England every time. I'm joking. Yeah, but everyone always says that. So, but when I went over to New Zealand, everybody well, you know wants... Well, you were at the Highlanders. Yeah, everybody yeah. wants to be an All Black. So that's the difference, it, I, I find. And the reason I think New Zealand... I think, the first reaction of a, of, a, of a young person over here is to be a football player or a reality TV star or an influencer, right? You're, when you were a young player, you loved, like when I said at the start of the show, you playing sport with, your, your, with Mercury and Michael and everything else, you loved with playing with the ball in your hands. My first reaction as a young player, I was encouraged to pick up a weight. You guys were encouraged to pick up a ball. You know, you, the club rugby over there. I think when, you, when, you, when we were over there, you, you ended up playing some club rugby for your local club side because you weren't playing super rugby. That just wouldn't, that wouldn't happen over here. But I think the reason New Zealand are so successful is that everybody lives and breathes rugby. Everybody wants to be an all black. That's like the, the pinnacle. And it seems from the outside that what, whatever your personality, when you go in that all black squad, you know, there's always a fear that there's another kid coming in and everybody's just happy to be there because they want to be an all black. Whereas I think over here, there's, yes, there's a hundred million, how many there is, but not a lot of people want to be rugby players. I don't know if what you, I don't know if you feel that same in New Zealand. That's what I found. Yeah, you're right there. I mean, you know, you spent some time at the Highlanders and, you know, Jamie was a coach who's a successful coach. You know, he coaches Japan and, and you know, from his coaching style that um, you got to earn to be in the place of, in the starting 15. Whether it happens in England, I don't know, but here everyone wants to reform and make the, the top, you know, they want to make the 15 to play. And if you don't make the 15, you're, you're gutted because you want to be the guy that's wearing that number. You want to be the guy that's wearing the jersey. But do you think the greatest thing in the jersey you can do is being all black? Because I, I, that's the impression I get. The best thing that anybody could do is being all black. You're like gods over there. Well, that's the pinnacle of rugby here, you know, for kids. We're such a small country, yet um, it's a national sport. It's a, it's a big brand and we're successful. And, you know, for young rugby players coming up, that's what they aspire to. And, you know, you're, you're on cereal boxes, uh, you're on ads on TV. And, and the good thing about the All Blacks, they're always in the community. You know where the All Blacks are going to be because if there's a test match in Auckland, they're out in the community. They're out in the suburbs. Yeah, you've got All Blacks coming to the school, you, you know, so you can actually see them and touch them. Have you noticed when you come over and say played in France or you played in Japan with me and you've worked with other, other players from other teams, you know, is it right that, that you, know, you see that you guys love to put, put, put ball in hand and your first choice is to do that and to go out there and play? And then you see other countries spending too much time in the gym. Or, do, you, do you see that? Do you see a real cultural difference about the way you approach rugby? Because I, I did. Yeah, I, I, I saw that in, in Japan. You know, and, and they've grown so much over the last 
nine years when we were there. We, they had top clubs where they had Suntory, they had Panasonic. We had Rico where all our workers, all our players were workers. And then other clubs, you know, they were actually pros. So they've grown from strength to strength. In France, you know, you played there as well. In Toulon, it's, you know, really laid back. But we were lucky because I played for a side who had won the Champions Cup three years in a row. And they had that tag of, this is a barbarian side. And um, so we had all great players. How did you find the transition from the All Blacks, where everything leads from, from schoolboy rugby to, to international rugby, to going to Toulon, which... As you say, the Galacticos, but the sort of common understanding is that it's sort of a bit loose at the fringes, if you know what I mean. It was different for me because um, it was just so structured at home and, um, you know, you were used to going to trainings. In Toulon, you know, it was so laid back. Did you love just, that or struggle with that? I struggled at the beginning because um, it was almost like nothing planned and, and, and no kind of training structured for us to turn up to the base. It was like you turn up to the base and it's like, oh, what time's training? Oh, the coach is not here. He's in Paris. I said, oh, okay. So I was looking at the foreigners going, man, what are we doing? Oh, we were in the gym, you know? So I was lucky. You know, we had Brian Obama, Drew Mitchell. We had Matt Guido, um, Dwayne Manmuelen was here. So we were like, let's train together. You know, my first year there, we had Bernard Laporte. And, uh, but he lived in Paris. So, you know, so some Mondays, he wouldn't turn up to Toulon until the Thursday. So we had all four days going, man. What are we doing? We turned out every weekend when we won our games. So, you know, we went all the way to the finals, top 14 final, while we lost to racing in um, Barcelona. So I enjoyed that that year because it was a year where we had all sorts of players, yet um, we actually, you know, could run the show. You know, Dylan was there and, you know, Dylan Armitage and we, we, we got along well, so it was great. Did you have to switch off your professionalism? Because, you know, jokes aside, you, you know, I, I've known you, you're very professional, uh, apart from all the creamed rice you eat. When, when, when we were in um, Japan, uh, Ma was the biggest importer of creamed rice, pineapple <laughs> lumps. And what was the other thing you always used to eat? Oh, man, I can't Corn remember. beef. No way. There was yes, beef. bro. Yes. I used to go into his house. Uh, I, I, I go to, so mate, it wouldn't have been me. It was, but I used, to, I used to come around and pop, cycle over and be like, Has, come over. I'd, tr- I'd knock on the door and he'd like slam the door behind him. And I'd be like, Mark, can I, c- can I, can I come in? He'd be like, ah, uh, the kids are in, I sleep. I was like, no, just, can I just come in? I just want to see what your house like, see what the, the highest paid parent in Japan's getting. And I, I went in and I couldn't open the door for pallets of cream rice, <laughs> corned beef and pineapple lumps. It was like a showroom. And when I came out, it was like, he was like, have you had this before? I was like, nah. And because he's so generous, I literally walked out with like piles of cream rice, pineapple. I had to put it in my basket of my little bike. Mate, he was, he was running a black market. Like Kiwis from other teams were like that. Is Marnon, you've got any cream rice? Mate, it was, <laughs> it was, it was ridiculous. I was, but, it away. I was giving it away. Yeah, well, yeah, of course you were. Um, did you, but what I meant was, did you have to put your professionalism on hold in France? I had to try and manage it because um, I thought, look, I don't actually have to try and perform at training because we don't actually train as intense as we do in New Zealand. It was like, all right, I need to train, stay fit, and then turn on the gas when it's 80 minutes on the weekend. It was like training with all the other foreigners who I've played against, learning the plays, and, you know, it was like, oh, no, this is how it is here in Toulon. It's a nice day, and uh, we'll just run the cutter when it comes to game time. How did you get on with Murad? Yeah, we got on well. He's a good guy. <laughs> Are you trying to go back to Toulon? <laughs> <laughs> He's not there anymore. Is it on, he? What's the craziest thing that happened? Because I spoke to Stefan Armitage once, and apparently after a loss, he'd drive round in his car, just shh, window down, seeing who, who lads are out and who's having a beer. Did you see any of that? He left us stranded a few times in different cities in um, Toulon because he flew back on the plane. We oh. lost to... Um, we played up north at one of the... Oina, it's yeah, it's Oina. It's like right next to um, Switzerland. It's about two hours from Lyon. So we lost to them, and they're like the bottom of the table. But obviously, when you play teams away, they're so hard to beat at their home, you know? People think, oh, no, they're not good. But when you get there, man, they just turn into a big side and they, and they play rugby. So we lost. He flew back on the plane and he told the manager, He's like, oh, you tell the boys to, to make their own way home. Manager comes on the bus, is like, oh, guys, Morad said, uh, you got to make your own way home. And we're like, man, where, where are we? We're like in the middle of, we don't know where we are. So the manager 
said, no, we'll catch the plane. And he said he was going to lose his job. So we obviously jumped on the flight and then he, he got stood down for two weeks, our manager, because he put us on the plane. All because the owner had said, find their own way home. And he was like, I'm not going to stitch you up. You guys, and you just went, okay, and went on it. And he got stood down because he disobeyed the owner. He's gone now. He's in Montpellier now, so. Is that Tom Whitford? <laughs> yep. Yeah. He's a good man. It is one extreme to the other, isn't it, really? Um, did you love France overall? And did you get out and about and, yeah. you know, take it in? I, I could live in Toulon. It was a beautiful place. My kids were speaking French. And, um, yeah, they were translating for me and my wife. So there would be people coming to the house and I was like, yo. And then they'll be like, you know, and then I was like, oh, Mercury. And he would <laughs> oh, be speaking. Oh, what did he say? And I was like, oh, okay. Because they will, they, we just chucked them into school when we got to France in 2.15 in December. And I could remember my two boys were just crying, crying, crying. I said, man, you got to go to school. So we dropped them off to school and they were crying. And I was telling my wife, Angie, I was like, man, I, you know, what have we done? Well, you know, why did we come to France? So they would finish school at 4.30, but we would turn up to school early, 4 o'clock. And honestly, I saw my son Michael at the fence crying. And I was like, oh, man. For two weeks, he was just sitting there by himself. And all they needed to do was just find mates. And then, you know, after about six weeks, they got into the groove of school, met, met all their friends, and off they were. But the first two to three weeks, man, it was hell. I was like, man, why did I come here? And the boys were crying. And my oldest would, they would, the school would ring us at lunchtime and say, oh, Mercury's sick. And he, he would make himself spew because he didn't want to stay in class. But when we look back now, it was a learning curve of, you know, how they needed to survive in a foreign country. But we would definitely go back. How was your French? I didn't, I didn't learn, man. I, I, we, we went to class. Me and Dwayne were going to classes. But, um, yeah, it was, just, it was tough. Because Tom was there, he was translating the whole time. So it was kind of like, it was 80% foreigners. So it was like um, Bernard would speak and all the French players would speak. And Tom would translate in the meetings. So it was like, okay, obviously we would sit back and listen to, to Tom. And there wasn't any kind of recollection on, on a field speaking French, you know. Matt was running the plays. Gitz was running the plays. Dylan was at fullback. You know, Stefan was at seven. You know, Brian on the wing. He had Machu Road centre. So it was like Josh Tuasova on the other wing. So it's like, oh, okay. It's all English, so, um, yeah. I regret not learning the language because... It was such a shame being there for three years and not even, you know, stringing a conversation with someone in French because it's such a beautiful language. Who was the best player you 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 played with on, on all your clubs, do you think? Oh, it's, it's, it's hard to say because we, we were such an immaculate side for Toulon with, with, you know, all the players that I laced through, you know. So I couldn't just pick one person outright. Our back line was stacked the whole, every kind of three years. You know, Matt was there, um, you know, Brian was on the wing, Dylan, you know, the second year come around, you know, Josh Tuisova started playing well. And then in the third year, um, you know, Chris Ashton came, semi dry, dry. So we had a back line every single year that was such a great side. It was just a shame we didn't win anything. What did you make of Chris Ashton? I, I, I actually liked Ash. We, we, we got along well. I would say, and I would quote, he's probably the fastest player I've ever played with. He is lightning. He is quick. His repeatability to do it over and over again, though, is what yeah. is amazing. We, when he first came, we had a fitness test. We had to do 1,220-meter sprints. So it was the foreigners that were doing it. So I came, Hugo Bonneville, Ash, um, and we had other two players that were in the Esquires. But Ash, man, he was just... Carbon. You know, I lasted probably the first four and then I was gone. But he, you know, he, he was just like a greyhound. He was like, ding, 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 ding. Is that ironic? A... Massive chest, little legs, but yeah, his little legs can keep carrying his massive little chest and his arms. Like all he did was bench and back forward. Yeah, he yes. can still just run. His mouth works <laughs> faster than his legs normally. <laughs> He gives me a run for money. Did he? How, how did he take it to the? How did the other players take to Ashley? I'm just interested because he obviously was top try scorer. Knows exactly where um, uh, an offload was. Did he go down well across the team, or did they think he was a mad northerner? No, I, th- I think he was. He was respected well enough in terms of the foreigners, you know, and the bunch of uh, French players we had. They were they were good enough, you know. I, I don't think there was any. Um, 
you know, kind of guys where they had battles in our side because it was just so cr- that cruisy that, you know, there wasn't really any friction. You know, everyone would try and have an input on, on the plays and what we needed to do. So, and Fabian Galtier was our coach in the third year. So, you know, he's now the French coach. You know, we had a lot of coaches and players there in my time there. It was amazing. It certainly sounds a circus. Um, I'm conscious of time. And I just want to ask a sort of couple of questions to, to finish up. Nine clubs, two World Cup winners medals and a whole host of glory in between. But what, what was the happiest period of your playing career? If you could go back and lace up your boots for one club, team, All Blacks again. Is, is there a period where you just think now, do you know, that was it? Well, well, well losing to England in the first game, I, I, I've never forgotten that. You know, being having tins on the show, like, you know, I'm still gutted to this day. I would say I've never lost to England again. So that was probably... <laughs> I'm joking. Yeah, the, the, those Rugby World Cup wins were quite special. One in, one in our country and then to back it up, back to back. So, um, but they were... Where are, your med- where are your medals today? Now, I, I can't find one of them. Wow. One of them's, one of them's in storage and I'm sure I know where the other one is, but... Um, the last time I remember where it was is I took it to a school to show them. But 2.15 was such a rush that we had to shut up shop and pack up the house to leave for France. And I must have thrown it somewhere, so I don't know where it is. What I, what I can say and what I'm really gutted about is when I played for the Blues last year, when we travelled to Argentina, we had to go to Sao Paulo first. And um, I made the mistake of leaving my two World Cup rings in one of my bags. My bags come out last on the conveyor belt and then my rings were gone. My bag was open and they got stolen. And what else was in there was my 50th watch that I played for the All Blacks. It was a tag Huya engraven against Australia on 2010. It was gone as well. That was a real shame. The start of campaign. It's just material things that I said before. It doesn't matter. How do you look back at this point on all that you've achieved in the game? I I couldn't say. I think... um, I think for me, as, as long as I got better and better as a player, then, and then I'm happy. Because as I said before, when I first started, I, wasn't, I was so raw that, you know, even when I played in, in the first game, my first test match, I was just a ball runner. I just wanted to get the ball in my hands. After that year after, I had to progress into something else because, um, you know, people said I had so many flaws. So I had to work on, you know, onto that. To this day, I'm still trying to get better. Um, I'm trying to move in and go to number 10, so hopefully that can happen before I retire. You're, you're moving in slower than Mattia Bastro. Am I right in saying he's gone to eight for San Diego? Yeah. Legion, yeah. Right? How's, how's he, he was, getting he, he going? At, at, uh, he was playing in New York. Was it New York? Have you played against him at eight? No, I haven't, actually. That's a hell of a conversion. I can't imagine the backs are getting a lot of the ball if he's at eight. <laughs> <laughs> he's at Leon now. Oh, is he? I tell you, Mar, just one... One, one thing just on your, on your development, because I know we are running out of time, is, is when do you think you were at your best? Because I, I remember seeing post-2011, but that period between 2011 and 2015, for me, you became like the, an all-round player. Kicking, clever kicking came into your game, handling, putting it like... Do you, do, you, do you agree that was your, probably your best period? Yeah, I, I think so. That was where um, I had a lot of confidence executing those kind of skills. Like, I always practiced kicking at, at training, but it was whether I could execute it in a game, you know. And I did try it in Super Rugby games, you know, trying to cr- kick cross, cross-field cross kicks or kick downtown, try to put in the 22 behind the, behind the fullback. There were grubbers, you know, and I was always like, I can't kick off my left. But I always did it at training. But it's when I started doing it when I played for the All Blacks, that's when I knew, I was like, you know, I've got the confidence to do it. But yet they gave me the license to do it. You know, I remember Steve Hansen at training, he was like, if you want to kick, just kick. You can do it, you know, and that was where I, okay. You know, you, you put that thought in your mind, it becomes a habit, and then you got to practice it. And then it can translate into something physical, and then you can display it out on the field. But you just got to work for it and work hard. But as you know, it's all mental. It's upstairs. It's a thought in your mind, and whether or not you, you can do it, doubt is the worst thing that can happen because a lot of people doubt themselves, and that could kill everything. You just have to be confident. You're being very humble. I'm going to read you a quote from the great Jean de Villiers, one great to another. Ma Nonu is the one that sits right at the top. 
I played against some brilliant players and always enjoyed the challenge, but Mars at the top of the list. I mean, it's, you know, there is a, there is a small group of you. Tins, final word to you. I mean, having been there when Mars started, double World Cup winner, we said at the top, one of, one of the game's great rock stars, but a man who's been there and done it. From my point of view, having been fortunate to play against him and, uh, and obviously probably the greatest partnership that's ever played the game, there'll, there'll be people who will argue with, uh, with Horan and Little and uh, even you can even go back to Bunce, Frank Bunce and Walter Little. But um, I think, you know, to play 61 times or whatever it was together and form that partnership, but then to watch Mar as an individual from where, where he started to, as Hass just said, to be that complete that complete centre um, with every facet of the game and how and I've just sort of always enjo- enjoyed watching that transition because you know never never for any kid out there it's the perfect sort of story never believe that you're you're there when, even when you're at the top you can always get better and you can st- and when you can still see that develop on a on an international s- scene I think tip my cap to you sir I think it was a fantastic career and and well earned and and it was a always a pleasure to play against you. And um, Mar, just before we go, will you do our weekly pop quiz, which is called Shoot from the Lip? It's a quick yeah, yeah, fire sure. question. Favourite word, Mar? Um, thank you. Least favourite word? Maybe no. That's my least favourite word. Greatest moment in the or, game? Or, or, no, I can't. Can't is my least favourite word. Very good. Uh, greatest moment with in the game? Okay, greatest what? Sorry? Moment in the game. I've got to be humble. You know, I want to say the try, but I can't. Shut God, up. Say, say, it. say the try. Me. Say the try. Embrace it. Oh. Okay, I'll say the try. Yeah. <laughs> uh, worst moment in the game? Oh, losing to tons, man. It was... <laughs> <laughs> Good. If you had to spend a million pounds in a day, what would you do? I'd give it away. Will you shut <laughs> up, please? <laughs> Look, at ass. Crap. Look at us. Look at Well, first, I'll buy a T-shirt for Hess to wear. <laughs> I tell you what, Mars got a fantastic clothing brand. You need to get more well. guns because those arms are still small. Heads. Suck too, bro. <laughs> <laughs> What's the clothing label? Quickly, Hass mentioned. Oh, Hess wears it all the time. Sub two. Sub two. Ah, good product placement. I'm sorry we didn't get there earlier. Um, <laughs> what sound or noise do you love? Um, sound of the ocean. Beautiful. Don't what say sound? it, Hess. There's obviously there's a, there's a watershed to this show. Uh, sound or noise that you hate? Hesker's voice. <laughs> uh, what profession other than your own would you love to attempt? I would like to be in the SAS if I had the chance. Wow. Would you fancy would, your chances? I wouldn't say I could make the make the SAS, but I would you know try try to kind of trial for it. Oh, that's very, yeah, good. But there's a post there's a post career <laughs> once you've hung up your boots. Um, if you could do a road trip with three players, who'd be in the car? I would take Jonah Lomu, the late John Lomu. I would take the late Jerry Collins, and I would probably take Johnny Wilkinson. I'm still owed a kicking session with um, Johnny because he was with Toulon for two years, and I was waiting in line, but I couldn't get in because oh, really? I wasn't the natural kicker. He was with um, Gertz, he was with James O'Connor, he was with Drew Mitchell, and I was always on the sideline going, "Oh, is, is there a chance?" He was like, "Yep, yep, yep." But the then problem, he left the problem is, life, when, he say, when he says you can come and kick it with him, all you are is a glorified return boy. You're just catching his ball and kicking it back to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 that as I'm going give you some coaching. No, you don't. You just want me to kick the ball back to you so you don't have to fetch it. Final question. What would you say to your five-year-old self now? I would say go to school. <laughs> 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 That's what I would say. You know, go to school and... I, I can't actually remember what I was like when I was five, but what I do know now is, is my kids, uh, I don't want them thinking that, um, you know, they're going to be natural rugby players because that's what they think. There's a lot of pressure in terms of a lot of players in New Zealand and their kids. When I turn up to the rugby fields and my kids are playing, every single parent is like, oh, which one's his son, you know? I don't push any kind of pressure onto any kids that their fathers have been professional rugby players. Whatever my kids decide to play, then I'm going to support them 100%. Yeah, I know you've been pulled into a few after-match speeches, but I know that Will Carling pulled you in, and Will Carling doesn't get speechless very often, but you managed to make him speechless. Are you going to share that with us? He told me that I had to promise him not to tell that story again. (laughs) (laughs) He was so Sorry, he's a friend of the show. Go. Uh, Well, I'll tell it if he gives me another envelope. (laughs) (laughs) 
Right. Stay humble, Ma. Stay humble. You're letting the, letting the thing slip. I want to be sure on Will because he'll message me on Instagram. Why did you do that? So I'll promise to tell you when I see you guys live, not online. Okay, perfect. That is a brilliant teaser because, Hask, you said at the start there are three Ma Nonus. We've done show one. We need him back for two and three, don't we? Yeah. Yeah, very much so. Look, I think, um, Mark, Bar, firstly, thank you very much for, for, for coming on. You've been brilliant. I think you've managed to play the humble card for probably an hour and a half. There's been a couple of little slips. We've, re- we've almost seen the, the, the real Mar, but I think, um, you know, it, it was amazing an opportunity to, to play with you. You know, you, I think genuinely, as, as Tinson has said, I think most people will agree that you were, you know, the best centre of the world for that, for, for that period of time. Um, you are one of the generous and kindest people I, I know. You know, I know that you've uh, tended to forget some of the stories of some of the stuff we got up to, but <laughs> hey, this is out soon, brother. You're getting it in there. So don't worry, don't... It's been a pleasure and... Um... Obviously, my kids are still up waiting because I can only put them to bed. So thanks for keeping them up. <laughs> oh, it's been brilliant. It's been a real <laughs> privilege and a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much. Come back and play again soon. Look after yourself in the meantime. And we may be doing a trip to San Diego, actually, at some point to come and see um, Rob Shaw and to check in on the MLR. So hopefully we'll see you at 10, ripping it up. Out oh, there Eddie's, Eddie's, um, Chris is bringing Eddie as well. So I heard he's... Yes. Coaches, so I'll give him some okay. tips on how England can get better. <laughs> Good man. <laughs> Um, right. listen well done thank you so much for coming Mark it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on that is it for this week thank you for watching thank you for listening to The Good, The Bad and The Rugby please do subscribe on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts just tap in Good, Bad, Rugby and do leave us a review as well some fairly sharp ones recently but if you're loving it we'd love to hear that um, thank you to Hask thank you to Tins thank you enormously to Mar Nonu one of the game's greats we are back in seven days time with another fantastic guest another international skipper and we'll be seeing you next week 